Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you all get a prize for, uh, <laughs> and that's that little lunch sandwich, for uh, making it out in this bad weather today. And I want to just welcome you, welcome you to the Aspen Institute's briefing. Today's briefing is called Working Towards a Secure Retirement, Strengthening Our Nation's Saving System. And uh, while we are going to figure out a way to strengthen the saving system, we had no control over the weather. And that has caused some changes in our schedule today. Unfortunately, uh, Congressman Neal uh, was unable to get uh, his flight uh, this morning, and he unfortunately will not be joining us. But Congressman Crowley uh, will be uh, starting us off, and, and Congressman Petri will be joining us later. And as well, Mark Ivory, the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Treasury for Retirement and Health and my wonderful panel, who I will also describe. I want to uh, recognize and thank the office of uh, Congressman Neil Brandon Casey, who's here, uh, Zach DuPont, who is here. Uh, if you're in the think tank business, you always need a few friends uh, who come through for you in the pinch. And uh, Congressman Neal has done that. Uh, he's been a frequent speaker. We are going to hold you to a speech in the future, Brandon. So stay tuned. Uh, you guys do not put the Aspen Institute in your spam filter. We want to invite you back, and we will have uh, we will have further events, uh, hopefully uh, soon, with Congressman Neal in presence. Um, also today, uh, Ed Murphy uh, of Putnam Investments also cannot be here. Uh, we have provided on your chair a um, set of remarks that he would have given. And any of you who are familiar with Putnam Investments know that they are dogged and deep believers in expanding the savings system. And uh, we will also bring Putnam back in the future because you will want to hear. Um, you, it's always good to hear uh, really top leaders in our business community join think tank leaders and others in really giving practical uh, solutions to our retirement crisis. And that's what our panel is going to do. And so I want to take a couple of minutes and just say who is up here with me. Um, I want to thank Eric Stevenson of Nationwide, who is the Senior Vice President and Chief Sales Officer for Nationwide Retirement Solutions. Eric usually resides in Columbus, and I'm sure Columbus, Ohio, usually has more snow than Washington, D.C., but I think we've beat you today. So welcome, Eric. Welcome to this table. We're going to look forward to some remarks from you. And as I said, uh, I am particularly gratified when business leaders who actually make a payroll and have a much bigger uh, job in practically delivering retirement uh, services to people are willing to come and be at a thought leader table. So thank you, Eric. Uh, to my left is Judy Miller. She's the Director of Retirement Policy for the American Society of Pension Professionals and Actuaries. Because we are an acronym town, ASPA is our favorite acronym. <laughs> Judy uh, is also the Executive Director of ASPA's College of Pension Actuaries. All those long titles uh, somewhat obscure uh, the heart and the smarts of Judy. She is not just someone with a lot of initials behind her name and a lot of acronyms. She's a deep thinker about retirement policy. She's a previous staffer on the Senate side and someone we turn to often when it comes to the puzzle of retirement. She has testified in this very house. Uh, I don't know if it was this room, uh, but we welcome you back, Judy, and we're going to look forward to your uh, comments. Um, while Putnam could not be here, I am thrilled that a, oh, a dear colleague of mine, Jeremy Greer of CFED, can join us today. And uh, Jeremy is by no means trying to speak for Putnam Investments. He's going to speak for himself and for CFED. Um, in the community that has thought about assets and wealth and savings, particularly at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, CFED is unparalleled in that uh, work. They have innovated and worked on savings ideas for over three decades. They are particular experts in child savings, which is something we're going to hear more about today. So Jeremy, I want to thank you very much for joining us today, coming in, pinch hitting. Uh, all of you are getting the 
view that if you know Lisa Mensa and the Aspen Institute, you too may be called in to be a panelist uh, last minute or to sit with me. I'm tenacious. I hold on to my friends and uh, you'll have your turn. But uh, to all of you, welcome very much to this briefing. Um, I want to say a few words about where we are in the season of tax policy. We are honored to be in a Ways and Means uh, committee room. Uh, many of you have been following um, the um, uh, news this uh, season, this week. Last week, we had a big announcement by the uh, chairman, uh, Camp, about uh, a new proposal of rethinking tax. And it's those kind of announcements that put this issue of retirement front and center. And I'm just very thankful that in a very busy time while we're looking at the tax code and the ways that we can improve retirement savings, we have several members who will join us today to give their thoughts on really what can be strengthened. If you're interested in this field, it's, uh, it's one of the most interesting fields in the way it weaves together tax, personal responsibility, asset creation. I love it because uh, I'm a serial student of all sorts of fields. And if you're going to be interested in savings and people's money, you've got to have a lot of uh, doorways into that field. And tax is certainly one of them. I see we have Congressman Crowley uh, with us this morning. So I want to take no more time at the podium. I will come back. And I want to recognize uh, Congressman Crowley. He is uh, one of a lifelong New Yorker. He represents uh, the Bronx and Queens and Brooklyn, my former home. And I am just so thankful for your leadership and so thankful you can be here to start us out. Welcome. Thank Congress you very much. Crowley. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Not, not Brooklyn, but Bronx. Oh, okay. <laughs> Close enough. My mother was from Brooklyn. Okay. Everyone's mother was from Brooklyn, right? You know, so I also want to apologize to the Aspen Institute for blocking the name. So it's, uh, it comes with me being who I am. Uh, but thank you for inviting me to be your, one of your keynote speakers of the day. Um, Lisa Menza and the, and the folks uh, here at the Aspen Institute have arranged a wonderful program for you all. Uh, the snow be damned, right? So uh, uh, despite your name, the Aspen Institute, I assume many of you have been to Aspen at some point in your life, uh, Washington doesn't handle the snow as well, so I apologize for that. Uh, I salute the excellent work of the Aspen Institute's initiative on financial security and their belief that creating wealth and, and building assets isn't something that people can just start later in life. It must start far earlier. The issue of securing a decent retirement for America's seniors has been at the top of policymakers' agendas since before the creation of the Social Security system and is one of the hallmarks of the American dream that each citizen who puts in a lifetime of hard work and raises a family can retire with at least a small pot of savings. For decades, government and business have subscribed to the idea that retirement security is created by a three-legged stool. You're all familiar with that. The first leg is Social Security, and this system remains strong. Contrary to critical reports, it is solvent and will remain so with only minor tweaks for generations to come. The second leg is pensions. In this area, we have seen an unfortunate shift in our country over the past few decades, away from the traditional defined benefit pensions plans, where workers were provided a guaranteed financial package in their retirement. But let me be very clear. Even though defined benefit plans may have receded, the idea that they no longer exist is not only false, it is dangerous. Over 40 million people today rely on these defined benefit plans, and there are actions Congress must take to strengthen them going forward. For example, large sections of the law that govern traditional DB pensions expire this December. Without modernization of the law, we could see the hastening of the demise of this critical underpinning of retirement security in our country. As a member of the Ways and Means Committee, I'm working to modernize the laws governing pensions so that DB pensions will continue for the next generation and beyond. The third leg of the stool 
is personal savings. This leg is just as important as the other two when it comes to ensuring the retirement security stool is steady, strong, and secure. But it also happens to be the weakest part and weakest leg of the stool today. Part of the problem is wage stagnation. The fact is, incomes are simply not keeping up with expenses. This results in families having to forgo savings in the long term to meet their basic daily needs of today. That is why I am pleased the President has outlined his plan to help workers save through the MyRA program. MyRA will help ensure all Americans have a secure retirement and greater savings during their, what ought to be their golden years. I'm pleased that uh, Mark Ivory is, uh, will be here to discuss uh, the MyRA accounts with you today. The President's initiative shows that he recognizes that if Americans can't save, they simply cannot grow. And if we're not growing, we're stagnating as a people and as a nation. I would also be remiss if I did not mention the leader in Congress on retirement savings, my good friend, Congressman Richie Neal from Massachusetts. They don't know how to handle snow either. Uh, so that has forced to keep him and his presence uh, here with you today. Uh, Richie ought to know snow. He's got the Berkshires in his district. Um, he has been on the forefront in helping people enjoy a more secure retirement. A key part is his bill, the Automatic IRA Act, which would require employers with 10 or more employees to enroll them in an IRA via an automatic payroll deduction. It does not, contrary to belief, it does not force employers to contribute to the IRA. But we know once employees start contributing automatically towards their own retirement, that money is perceived as gone. They often forget about the withdrawal and the investment that they're making and do not take actions to proactively stop the withdrawals. It's like building a nest egg simply by accident. Financial security is not just about retirement, but about every stage of a person's life. Americans need to save if they're going to afford college, invest in a home, cover unexpected emergencies, or take the risks that are necessary to start a new business. Unfortunately, the saving picture in the United States today is bleak. As a result, we are seeing a new generation of Americans growing up with no assets and little ability to either climb the economic ladder or simply weather a difficult time. But this savings crisis is not just an issue that affects individual families. It is a major public policy issue. A lack of individual wealth creation has broad macro ramifications for our entire economy. We know that higher levels of household savings and investment not only lead to higher growth in, 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 our, in, our, in the economy, but also stronger human capital. And greater savings allows banks to lend, businesses to invest, and jobs to be created. We would also agree that saving money today for unexpected expenses tomorrow is good for both individual households and our overall economy. We would also agree there is a strong need to create a cultural savings from the earliest days, which is why I will be introducing legislation in the coming days to create a new savings vehicle for every American child known as U.S. accounts. In short, my proposal will ensure that upon the birth of a child, a U.S. account will be established in that child's name. Annually, that child's family will be allowed to deposit up to $2,000 into the account. But we cannot assume that all families have the kind of money or disposable income that would afford them the ability to deposit the maximum amount allowable each year. That's why my proposal goes a step further, providing a $500 in seed funds at the creation of the U.S. account and expanding the refundable child tax credit dollar for dollar up to a maximum of $500 annually to match a family contribution. Additionally, 
My bill would authorize a match equal to the family contribution to be directly deposited into the U.S. into the U.S. account, eliminating some of the administrative complexity and allowing these accounts to grow. This U.S. account match would phase out along the lines of the EITC, ensuring it targets those most in need and meets the needs of larger families. Again, to help those at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder who have the least ability to save, the bill would also create the refundable child tax, would increase the refundable child tax credit up to a maximum of $500 annually support, to support the fam that, that family's contribution. Uh, this family match, which would also be income targeted, would allow families suffering from st stagnating incomes who can barely make ends meet have the opportunity to build a nest egg for their children. These accounts would, they would grow tax-free, they'd be locked away until the child went off to college or when they no longer were dependent, and the income buildup would be exempt from any public benefits test. While the accounts would first be created by the government, the parents would have the option of keeping their funds in a TSP-style account or transferring the U.S. account to a private financial services institution that is registered with the government to handle these types of accounts, much like we saw in the example of England. So this will literally work for everyone, for all Americans. It combines savings and support to ensure that it is cost-effective, simple, and easy to do. Now, I know this is the question you all want to ask. Does this type of plan cost money? Yes, it does. But what is more costly is a society coming of age deeply in debt with no savings and a belief that savings is something for the elite few and not for everyone. Income security is the issue of our time. But action is needed if we're going to ensure the retirement three-legged stool is sturdy and can withstand the test of time. Last week, my Republican colleagues released their blueprint for tax reform. While I have grave concerns with their plan, I do welcome its introduction because I see it as a sign that both sides of the aisle recognize the need to have this conversation. It is my hope that the path we ultimately take with tax reform is that we will put in place policies that help to lift people up. Our tax code needs to help lay a foundation that will ensure our economy works, not just for the few, but for everyone. Facilitating savings and wealth creation for the many must be part of that plan. And you can be sure I will be advocating for the inclusion of the U.S. accounts. And I hope I can count on all of you to help advocate and build support for this proposal. Again, I want to thank you uh, all for allowing me to be a part of this discussion uh, and for all of you braving the snow, the terrible, terrible snow, which will be at an end at some point, I know. Uh, and uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to entertain them. That good an idea, I know, it's great. We have not uh, introduced the legislation as of yet. Oh, sorry, go ahead, yeah. I was just gonna repeat the question. She asked if there were any interested co-sponsors from the Republican Party, so. Thank you, thank you, Lisa. Uh, as of yet, we have not introduced the bill and we haven't floated for co-sponsorship. What I do think is interesting about the bill is uh, there are a couple of aspects to it I think my Republican colleagues will find enticing. Um, one is that we, we kind of model this uh, off of the, uh, the child tax credit, which is something that uh, has bipartisan support and has had bipartisan support. In many respects, it's kind of an enhancement of that uh, and the opportunities that that provides for, uh, for, for families today. We would enhance that for future uh, savings. Um, the other is that I think uh, the 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 movability of the account, um, that it can be either kept in a TSP style account uh, with Social Security Administration, or it can be, uh, the family uh, can use and approved uh, by, the, by, by the Fed, uh, by the Treasury, a, um, an institution that has met, met their approval 
Uh, so it gives it both a, a public and a private uh, component that I think my Republican colleagues would, uh, would find attractive and would hope. Thank you. Thank you. Justin King, New America. Well, as I said before, that uh, this is uh, for when they go to college or when they, no, we, I know we have the 529 accounts and there are other uh, means that, uh, w that in terms of uh, tax benefits that, that help make for a college more affordable. What, one thing we do know, college is not affordable for, for, many Ameri for most Americans today. Um, and if that's the case now, we can only anticipate that down the road, unless we make some changes uh, to help people uh, to save now, in addition to what they may be trying to do, uh, it's going to be unreachable. Uh, certainly the private institutions will be unreachable uh, without uh, scholarship, et cetera, for the, the least amongst us. Uh, so that would be an opportunity. It, it certainly would be uh, um, a nest egg that that individual, and it's, if there's multiple children in that family, that multiple children in that family will have access to uh, either uh, uh, a time when they're going to college or when they become emancipated, uh, and we'll have that nest egg where they can invest it, uh, where they can uh, buy a home, where maybe start a business. Uh, but I think what would be in place is the notion or idea of the importance of saving. Uh, and I, I think that's maybe the more critical uh, part about the bill is uh, getting more interest and uh, maybe driving home not only that we want you to save, we need you to save for the future, and that's what the bill would do. I, I, you know, I'd like to say I'm shocked that Chuck Schumer had the idea first. I mean, I'd be lying if I said that. <laughs> I, I'd be shocked. But um, Chuck and I are good friends, and, um, and, uh, and I'd love to work with him uh, to, to further this notion or, or our notions or ideas and maybe meld them together if that's possible to, uh, to go on even support within the Senate. Other questions for Congressman Crowley? Please. I missed the, missed the last part. The, the marriage penalty. I don't address it per se directly here in the bill, but I'll be happy to look at that and see if we can make some suggestions in, in the, uh, the overall tax overhaul discussions that are going on right now. We do know that the EITC, though, is uh, one aspect of helping to, cre to decrease poverty and making work work for the, uh, the poor. And we should not be building roadblocks in that. We should be making that as available as possible. What I do know is that billions of dollars are left on the table every year because people don't apply for them, either because they don't know about them or they're moving, uh, et cetera, and they're not, uh, they're not following through on that. Uh, but that's uh, one way to get money directly where it's needed and where it's going to be spent pretty quickly as well and help to infuse our, the economic growth of our economy overall. So I'd be happy to, to look into that. And Kevin Casey from my staff is taking those notes down now. So. Other questions? I'd like to finish off with one question. You made a beautiful um, pitch for not giving up on defined benefit mm -hmm. plans. And you also mentioned that there are some provisions that are set to expire. Uh, are you willing to opine a little on whether or not the Congress will be able to address uh, some of the pension issues in this Congress? Well, that's, uh, I guess, not only for this issue, for just about every issue before us today. Will we have the political will to get these things done? Um, like, uh, I think, the discussion going on now with tax reform, uh, what I do think ultimately will happen, we'll have to address tax issues before the end of the year, regardless of whether or not we, pass, we, tass, we actually pass tax reform itself, which I highly doubt. The Senate has already indicated they will not be doing that. But there are things that we need to get done, like extenders, that will have to be done. Uh, there are things that our committee will have to do, like uh, DB uh, pension uh, uh, issues that will expire at the end of the year. I do, I do believe that we will get back to doing uh, work. I, you often hear it said, regular water. We'd like to see, the, see that actually take place. Uh, Richie Neal is a big uh, uh, proponent of regular order as well. Uh, but I do think we have to get back to dealing with the issues that have deadlines and that have ramifications as well. And I, I, I do know there are Republicans who want to address these issues as well. So I do think we'll have bipartisan support for that. 
will you join me again in thanking Congressman Craig? Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of the rest of the week. Thank you, Kylie. Do they block Thank Aspen? You. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kylie. Thank you all. Thank you. Ah, snow be damned. We are going forward. All right. Uh, I am. Uh, I'm going to bring back my panel here. Not that they left anywhere, um, but uh, I get to uh, start this with a few more remarks. Um, I think it's interesting that. Uh, when we were thinking about this event, we did not know that Congressman Crowley was going to uh, uh, move forward with a child account bill, and it's very exciting to us. You'll see on your papers a and your chairs a paper we are introducing today called Child Trust Funds, Renewing the Debate for Long-Term Savings Policies. Uh, you can tell by the title, Child Trust Funds, that it's something non-American, because we, uh, we do have trust funds, but it's a title that comes out of the British system. And I really commend this paper to you uh, for later reading. We thought it was time to come back and look at the world's largest experiment with child savings, and that was in the UK. And um, you know, for several years, the UK tried the idea that uh, something similar to what the congressman is talking about, of giving 250 pounds or 750 pounds or, to every child born in the UK. So there are over three million of these accounts. Um, I think we get up to five in our own uh, on our own paper, and I I give this to you as kind of an interesting story. Austerity politics scuttled the idea after several years of doing this. So we actually have a fascinating experiment going on. What will probably be no surprise to you is while the policy in pl was in place, families were saving. Once the policy was scuttled, very little saving, particularly at the bottom, happened in just the regular tax-free vehicles. So I do think it's an interesting part of the story about what propels long-term savings. I think I, I want to make three points in my own remarks. Uh, the first is that this is the right moment to be talking about long-term savings, and I want to key off uh, some of the things that uh, Congressman Crowley spoke about. And the second part is that I think small actions can make a big difference. And third, I want to talk about, uh, I want to come back and end on the child accounts again. So why do I think this is the right moment? Why is Aspen doggedly plogging forward, snow or not, in this? To, uh, in our view, the moment to talk about savings is actually when we have a looming crisis of retirement and a frustrated set of American households who are feeling the American dream out of reach. And it is that recession fatigued, household that understands that the dream is slipping, that makes us feel that this moment really is the moment to talk about long-term savings policy. It's also, I liked where Congressman Crowley ended, at some point Congress comes back to regular order and moves uh, ideas forward and moves legislation forward and there will be vehicles going forward that have a chance to address some of the nagging issues and certainly the lack of retirement savings and the lack of overall savings is one of those. So we do feel that we are in the right timing, that quietly, uh, many of you are here, are on the staffs of many uh, members, both on the Senate and the House side, and we know why we can't get our calls returned. You are busy. And uh, while we haven't had a lot of signing in the Rose Garden, we know that the work is going on underneath, and we, we applaud that. And we urge you uh, to keep the good work going forward and to pay particular interest in this long-term savings need. I want to end my remarks on why we've been interested in child accounts and why we see this as linked to the retirement debates. It doesn't sound like it at first, but our main conviction is that Americans need to own more than they owe and that the only way to do this, to have our ownership numbers go up, is to start earlier. A fundamental change that would move all four million children into the savings system would be a complete cultural game changer. 
in our own view, these should be private accounts that are held by the private sector and uh, move with us through our lives. But no matter how they are created, we feel that that would be the game changer to really put Americans on a path to owning more than they owe. And that will always be the points we come back to. Uh, I wanted to say those remarks, but I also want to welcome my panel today. And I've asked uh, Judy Miller, and then Eric Stevenson, and then Jeremy Greer to each give us some remarks. I had these brutal calls where I said, you'll only have three to five minutes. You will now have your full five. So take what you need. Yeah, so Judy, would you please uh, welcome. Thank you, Lisa, for arranging this under the, the uh, very difficult circumstances. Um, ASPA focuses on, on retirement security, so I'm going to leave child accounts for the moment and, and focus on uh, saving for a secure retirement. We all know there are three basic things we need to do to strengthen the nation's retirement savings system. We need to expand access to workplace retirement saving. We need to increase the amount of contributions that are going in for those who do have access. And we need to help workers that are nearing retirement age make appropriate decisions about how to convert their lifetime of savings into a secure retirement. I'm going to focus, focus on the first task today, expanding the availability of workplace retirement savings, because the most important thing we can do to improve retirement security is to expand the availability of workplace retirement plans. The only way we've been successful at getting working Americans to save for retirement is through workplace retirement plans. You've probably heard this statistic before, but over 70% of workers making between 30 and 50,000 will save if they have a plan at work, and less than 5% will save if they have to go out and set up an IRA on their own. By compare, um, tens of millions of American workers already do have a workplace plan. Most of them are middle class. 80% of participants in 401k and profit sharing plans make less than 100,000 a year. 43% make less than 50,000. Now there are some competing statistics about how many people don't have a plan at work, but there's general agreement that it is millions of people, and so it is something that we really need to address and stop uh, arguing about what the numbers are. These people that don't have a plan at work, you know, that puts them in that less than 5% category. They're, you know, there's less than a 5% chance that they're going to be saving. And because many of them are lower income or, or part-time workers, that's, that probably is even uh, less than your, your typical uh, 30 to 50,000 person. We can improve the success rate dramatically by simply expanding the opportunity to save at work. And we need to do that without reducing coverage for those that already do have a plan at work. Because workplace plans uh, play such a critical role, ASPA strongly supports Representative Neal's auto IRA proposal. I'm sorry he wasn't here today to speak about it, but I'll uh, maybe take up some air time and, <laughs> and make up for that here. Uh, there are other proposals that we support, but none would be as effective at truly expanding coverage as Neal's auto IRA bill. For example, we support the Starter 401k in Senator Hatch's SAFE Act. It's a deferral-only safe harbor to encourage employers to offer workplace savings arrangement. Now, the Starter 401k would be helpful on its own, but it would be powerful coupled with auto IRA. Similarly, multiple employer plans, MEPS, could be a good alternative for some employers, but they're not likely to make a significant um, inroad on expanding coverage without an accompanying requirement for small business to, to consider these arrangements. We also support an improved savers credit because it'll help lower paid people be able to save but an improved savers credit without increased availability of workplace savings would not make a significant impact on coverage. Auto IRA, in other words, makes all these other proposals better. Because contribution limits for IRAs are less than for employer-sponsored uh, 401k plans, auto IRAs are not expected to um, cut into for current 401k plan sponsorship. Now, if the starter 401k were also in place, we think many employers would opt to go the starter 401k route instead of an auto IRA arrangement, and then they'd already be in their 401k plan, and when they're comfortable, when the business gets more established and, and they actually have some cash to save themselves, um, they'd be in a position to very easily move up into a more robust arrangement. 
But either way, uh, once employers and employees get used to payroll deduction savings through auto IRAs, we believe employers will be more comfortable, again, once their business is stable, moving up to uh, a more substantial plan. Uh, GAO agrees that auto IRAs would increase savings. Their August 2013 report on auto IRAs found that 36% of households across all income groups could see an increase in savings if auto IRAs were implemented nationwide. In addition, households in the lowest earnings quartile would benefit most. As GA GAO calculated, the projected median annuity for those households could increase by two-thirds. Now, in the absence of federal auto IRA structure, ASPA has been supportive of state auto IRA proposals, such as legislation passed by California in 2012, and current proposals in Maryland, Connecticut, and Illinois. In fact, uh, Brian Graff, our executive director, may well have been here today instead of me, but he's testifying at a hearing in Maryland on their auto IRA bill that uh, Representative Hucker has. They already had a hearing last week on uh, uh, the bill in the Senate. So California passed the structure, but they need additional enabling legislation to make it work. So um, if, probably in England somewhere I could bet on this, but um, if I were to do that, I think that it's likely that it'll be Maryland or Connecticut or Illinois that actually gets one of these programs up and running uh, before California because of all the, the roadblocks that were really, really put in the way there. Now, we do hope <laughs> that Congress will step up and passed federal auto IRA legislation because this patchwork of state bills is not a good thing for the long run. Um, I'm hoping that when there's one or two, maybe that'll kind of move uh, federal action because right now it just doesn't seem to be able to, to get over the hump. But um, in the meantime, it's not that there's no activity. There is uh, increased activity at the state level. Now, I do want to be clear that we would strongly oppose any proposal that would mandate employer contributions or force employers that already have a qualified retirement plan to also withhold and forward contributions to some other arrangement. You know, small business owners really are often struggling to get by, and they shouldn't be burdened with any additional costs. Now, auto IRA would carry no additional costs. It would be very simple to get the payroll withholding set up, and the Neal bill actually provides a, a modest credit that should be more than sufficient to, to cover any, any minimal expense there would be. So um, we look at auto IRA as, um, you know, we know people save through payroll deduction at work. You can't get payroll deduction savings without having access to the payroll system. And there's the employer um, sitting there. So. Um, don't view auto IRA as an employer mandate. View it as uh, a function that necessarily goes through the employer and that, that we need to have in place to, to enable these workplace savings bills. So uh, for employers that are already voluntarily offering an ERISA plan, uh, they just should not be forced to also participate in, in one of these other arrangements. Um, so in summary, the key to improving retirement security is obvious, and that's expanded workplace savings. We need to focus on proposals like auto IRA bill offered by Mr. Neal to bring workers into the workplace savings system, and ideally we would couple that with Senator Hatch's starter 401k and probably uh, some of the MEP proposals as well. Um, on the brief, briefly on the subject of MEP proposals, uh, since I, I probably am taking more than five minutes, sorry Lisa, but. Um, <laughs> there are proposals in a number of bills, including, uh, you know, a Neal bill. There had been proposals in, um, you know, kind bill in the past, and there are. There's a proposal in the Nelson and Collins bill, and the Hatch bill, and uh, f something similar called pooled arrangements in, in Harkins bill. Um, we favor um, the Hatch or, uh, you know, the the pooled arrangements in the Harkin Bill is, is too limited. But what Hatch and, and that proposal have in common is the idea of a designated service provider for open maps. You know, if you have employers that have no other commonality other than belonging to this plan, um, we think it's important to provide security for those employers. They're adopting this program in good faith. There should be somebody that steps up and says, 
<laughs> we're doing the work. <laughs> if something goes wrong, yeah, blame me. And so um, we, we would urge you to take a look at, at uh, those in terms of the service provider idea. Now, if auto IRA and starter K cannot be done and what's left of this Congress, I would encourage us to try to make a start. Uh, for instance, it could help potential state auto IRA proposals be successful by allowing auto enrollment in IRAs without interference from the Patriot Act. <laughs> There's a provision in the Neal Bill. This doesn't get discussed much at the state level, but it's a real thing. Um, you're going to automatically enroll somebody, and then you say, oh, by the way, you know, <laughs> here's a, I need this ID, I need whatever. Uh, it kind of, you know, breaks the flow of this auto idea. Um, it also uh, should make it clear that auto enrollment with an opt-out is still voluntary and doesn't make payroll deduction IRA and ERISA arrangement. So even if we can't do it all, let's do something. And something could be a big step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. I'm going to ask Eric Stevenson. Well, uh, thank you, Lisa. Uh, on behalf of Nationwide, we really are excited to, to partner with you and to be here. And um, just the whole vision that you have around Aspen Institute and the idea of saving more, saving sooner is so powerful, especially for, as you talked about, folks at the bottom of the pyramid. That's, that's so key, and we're very supportive of that. Just by way of context, as she mentioned, my name is Eric Stevenson. I work for Nationwide Insurance, and um, actually half our company, Nationwide Financial. And in particular, my focus is around our government business. So retirement savings for people who work for cities, counties, states, municipalities. Um, for a little more context, for example, the state of Maryland is our oldest client. They've been our client for almost 40 years. The um, state of New York is the largest 457 plan in the country at about $16 billion. But we also have uh, plans that just started up last month that have five employees and have uh, $50 in them as well. So we cover the spectrum. And this whole idea around savings for America, savings for all, um, is really near and dear to our hearts. Um, the part that we like to bring in as well, so we talk about, you know, is there a crisis out there and what's going on? And that word gets tossed around a lot, as you might guess, and you hear crisis. But the part that we feel like is, is being missed is we, we talk about, there, what is there, 15,000, I think, uh, folks that are turning 65 every day. Many of you probably heard that stat. That's a huge number. But maybe more importantly is of those folks that are 65, how many of them are even thinking about not just what they need in terms of food and housing and clothing, but what about health care? Mm -hmm. That feels to us like that's the missing part around retirement. So, for example, of that 65,000, of that 15,000 people that um, retire, that turn 65 every, every day, um, one in ten, once you hit 65, you have a 70% chance that you're going to need long-term care some, at some point in your, in your retirement. Well, guess what? One in 10 people actually has any sort of long-term care support. So add that in terms of retirement. Of all the people that we talk to that have an advisor, and not many Americans actually have an advisor, but of those that do, only 25% of those have ever talked to their advisor about health care costs. So you, think of, you talk about the crisis, and most people don't even include the huge expenses in health care. And then you look at what that's going to be 10 years from now and health care costs and where they're going, that will be. This crisis now is only going to just magnify over the next uh, few years. Um, our role in terms of what we believe that we can do, we've been uh, in this business for a long time, both in the private sector in terms of serving small businesses, but also in the government sector for nearly 40 years on, on both sides. But as Congressman Crowley mentioned, we are a huge supporters of the three-legged stool and that balanced approach. We think it's nearly impossible to have a successful retirement with all three of those legs. So uh, we're very supportive of the pension system and any reform that's needed there. We're very supportive of that. The second piece around, he mentioned Social Security, and then he, he called the third piece personal savings, which is the space that we talk about, whether that's 401k, 457 for government workers, 403b for school. Uh, and then individual savings as part of that space is a huge piece of this. But um, without that balanced approach, most folks don't have a real shot at having a successful um, retirement. We're very supportive of any legislation or any private-public partnership that wants to expand access to retirement savings. Um, anything that will increase the ability, um, uh, not limit the ability or the amounts that people can save, we think that's really important. And the third piece is the education, the promotion. And you heard the previous speaker just talk about workplace savings. And I will still tell you there are still many, many people that are in those workplaces, in those environments that haven't taken advantage of that. And a lot of that is just around 
education and promotion. And uh, one of the relationships that we have that we're really proud of here is um, we work, do a lot of work with the International Association of Firefighters. And just a little anecdotal story is they have some of the highest savings rates in the country. And the reason for that is when you start in public safety, one of the first meetings that you have is you'll have a captain or you'll have a leader, someone you respect will pull you aside and they'll say, Lisa, if you don't do anything else, you have to start savings today. And so we have young folks, young men and women at 21, 22, 23 years old that are saving significant amounts of dollars because someone just took the time to encourage them to do that. That happens in, in private sector as well. When someone will engage at that level, that's what makes, that makes a huge difference in people just getting started. So when, this, when the congressman was talking about getting people started at birth, uh, that idea, I love that idea because savings is a habit. And once you, once you engage in that, in that habit, um, it becomes a way of life. But if you don't, and the later you wait in life, the more difficult um, it becomes. And I was telling Lisa earlier, I think she has a career in marketing as well because her tagline of <laughs> save sooner, save more uh, couldn't, be, uh, uh, couldn't be more appropriate. And one of my own little taglines is we, all, we often talk about retirement savings, you know, savings for retirement. I like to say what we're really doing is savings for life. All the things that the congressman mentioned around college and around first house and around just providing um, uh, a decent life for your family all starts with savings and absolutely saving more than you owe. But saving sooner, saving more, and we're all for that at Nationwide. So thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. This is why I'm lucky. I have great people join me. Jeremy Greer, would you please uh, join us and give a few remarks today? Thanks, Lisa. Um, and thank you, everybody, for um, apologize. I'm pinch hitting, so my the, you just got to grab a bat off the shelf when you pinch hit. And mine was the <laughs> notebook that was sitting on my desk to write down a few remarks. So I, this is an exciting day for me to to hear a member of Congress come to a podium and talk about kids' accounts. Um, this is a day that uh, CFED has been involved in and, and behind working with like Lisa, Justin, New America, um, Carol, who was my predecessor at CFPD, I'm now in Congressman Ellison's office, had been working for a long time in Congress to promote this idea of, of child savings. So to hear a prominent member of uh, Congress come here and talk about it is an exciting, exciting day. And, um, <clears throat> and not just a proposal that would really move the needle and really move things forward um, is really exciting. Um, so just a little note, so Lisa had mentioned CFED and how long that we've been, been at this. We've been at this for over a decade around kids' accounts, and, it's, and it, we weren't at it alone. We worked with a lot of groups, Ford Foundation, New America Foundation, um, University of Washington um, in St. Louis. A lot of, a whole field was built up around the idea of moving on one principal idea that, <clears throat> And, and our president, Andrea LeVere, would say this if she was at the podium today, that parents would do for their kids what they won't do for themselves. So if they, maybe they didn't invest in their own education, but they're going to work to invest in their kids' education. And that's kind of the, what motivated the idea around child savings. And what we've seen is this kind of slow arc over the last 10 years of real momentum being built up in the field. So some of you um, may be familiar with the um, city of San Francisco, county of San Francisco's kindergarten and college program. Essentially, it's a program where every kindergartner in um, San Francisco gets an account and a small seed and an opportunity if they save in that account to build up um, a nest egg for their education. Uh, there's similar initiatives taking place in Cuyahoga County. Um, another initiative similar to that in Nevada, in the state of Nevada. So what we've seen is a real culmination of these programs happening around the country, big ones like San Francisco, and even small ones like a program in the Mississippi Delta that's being operated through a small credit union um, in Mississippi. But what this has done is we've learned a lot over those years around what works, what doesn't work. We've had researchers come in look at the data, say this works, this doesn't work, you should look at this. And what's so exciting to hear about what the congressman said today was this bill is really rooted in a lot of what we've learned, um, which gives us a lot of confidence that moving forward, there's a, we can move forward in an informed way that is built upon the knowledge that we've accumulated. So I'm gonna share a couple of those learnings that I think are captured in the legislation, what we heard from the um, congressman. 
one, universality is critical, right? It's about, it's not just that poor people have difficult time saving, it's working class people, it's middle income people, it's, it's a large segment of our population that just has a difficult time saving. Some of it is resource, and some of it, as Eric mentioned, is just no, that people don't know, or they don't have access to the right tools. So that's key, universality. Another thing that we've learned over the years is that incentives really drive behavior, right? Providing a, a match or an account with dollars already in it has an effect on whether people are going to take advantage of that account to save. So that's something we learn. And for very low-income people, if you provide additional incentive beyond what everyone else gets, it's even more incentive to drive low-income people, the people who probably need the support the most, to save. <clears throat> and another thing that we've learned, and um, New America had an um, event last week on this, is that how key the tax time moment is, because you have a captive audience to really educate people about savings. So you think about it for a low-income person that's filing their taxes, they take advantage of the child tax credit, the EITC, and they get probably the largest lump sum payment that they'll get over the course of an entire year. That's the moment you want to have a conversation with someone about savings. You don't want to have a conversation about savings um, in the middle of the year when the rent's due and the lights are due and the heat bill's due or they're going to cut the heat up. You don't have it then. You have that conversation at a point in time where they have enough money on hand to think aspirationally and think beyond the now. So it's what we've learned is that that tax time moment is key. And as I mentioned, what's exciting about this bill and listening to, to what um, Senate Republic, Representative Crowley said, this bill captures all of those pieces, all of those aspirations. So we're starting from a place where we can really move forward to really make a difference. Um, before I step back into my chair, I do want to um, talk a bit about um, the point that Lisa was making, that when we're talking about kids' savings, what we're really talking about is lifetime savings. So we can't go about this in a siloed approach, where you've got kids' savings at the beginning of life, you have maybe people saving from home ownership or f to start a business for other reasons in the middle of life. And then you have retirement. That same culture of savings translates all throughout that life continuum. So I think what we want to argue, and I think what's in the best interest for, just for everyone, recognizing that there aren't a lot of people saving as much as they should. I mean, Julie said, let's not fill about the numbers, let's acknowledge people aren't saving as much as they should, what's the best time to capture them? And I, I think I'd argue, and I think some would agree with me, that children, I mean, we teach children learn all the life skills they need to carry out for the rest of their life at that point in time, early in life. So why would savings be any different? And research has shown that tying that education around financial education, how you manage your money, what do you want to do moving forward? If tied to account that makes it real and tangible with money in it, it's going to have an effect. They're going to pay more attention because they got something that's theirs. It's not just some, another thing the teacher is teaching me. It's something real. So what I would say is how we should have this conversation about retirement security with all the challenges as it relates to people that are beginning to work or are working, I'd say some of the solutions might be in thinking about how are we moving people towards saving early in life. So with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sit down and look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Jim. I love these impromptu things. They always work best. Uh, Jeremy and Judy and Eric, all three of you have made impassioned pleas for what we should be doing as a country, which is uh, to expand this system. I want to uh, ask a question of this group, and then I want you as the audience to be thinking of one question as well. And uh, as soon as we uh, 
as I ask my question, I see our wonderful Congressman Petri here, so we're going to let him. We'll let him catch his breath, though, for a moment. Um, Judy, I want to come back to you. I want to start with you, and then I'll ask Eric and uh, Jeremy. Um, just opine for me a while. Um, why has it been so hard to move the needle, as you say? And this seems like ground that's been heavily bipartisan in the past. Why, why, uh, why has it been so hard, and what gives you some sense of, of what the block is? Auto IRA was more bipartisan in the past than it has been for the last um, few Congresses. And, um, you know, originally when, when bills first appeared in, in both the House and the Senate, there was bipartisan support. The last couple of Congresses, it's been strictly a, a proposal coming from Democrats. And, um, you know, proposal coming from a House Democrat uh, tends not to have a, a bright future uh, <laughs> in terms of this Congress. So um, I think part of it is looking at, um, you know, what can we do to, um, to, to do what we can to, to get something done without being in a rigid structure that we're saying we need to do this whole thing or else we're not going to do it at all. Um, like I've, I've spoken to some people, and I don't know that I have a, I don't have a lot of people behind me on this one, but I think that um, if there's concern about requiring all employers to offer auto IRA, um, that it might be helpful if we had a, a structure, a federal structure that said what the default investments are, that said um, if employers of a certain size do this, that they're going to get the credit to help defray expenses. And it could actually make it easier for states to do something if they wanted to. And and do it in the framework that um, you know doesn't have something different in every uh, you know every time you cross a state boundary. So, um, but you know I, I think it's it's just you know we have these proposals. There's some piece of it that somebody doesn't like, and this there hasn't been enough legislative activity. I think to just say okay, let's sit down and pound it out. It's like okay, we have this proposal. No, we don't like this proposal. As opposed to saying how much of this do we like and and, and what can we modify to, to move forward and at least have some good structure in there? Jeremy, you're nodding. Do you have any additional insights before I recognize Congressman Petri? Yeah, I, would, I think what I say is that I agree with Judy that there really has to be a focus on what we, what we agree on um, and not get into to old fights of the past, you know? For, for low-income people, I mean, we know what the problems are that that, that prevent them from saving, um, that are structural, right? I mean, the tax code does not incentivize savings for people on the lower end in the way that it does for people on the higher end. Um, there are ways that we know how to fix that, right? There's a saver's credit that just doesn't work very well for them, and there are lots of proposals out there that would fix those problems. I mean, it, it, it isn't a question of how, whether there's a People don't know how to do it or aren't proposals out there that would suggest how to do it. It's really a question of will. And I think when we get to a point where we can have real conversations about this without a lot of the, the, the partisan backstory, um, we could do it. Thank you. Eric, a business leader's perspective on why we're stuck and what might unstick us? <laughs> well, I just, I just think in many cases we have bad math. And what I mean by that is uh, we think about what are the costs for people's savings and the benefits now, but what the math that we don't bring into account is what is it going to cost us on the back end if they don't? So if you don't have adequate savings later in life, where do they show up when they're sick? Where do they show up when they don't have housing? And it costs society a tremendous amount of, um, amount of money. So providing incentives, providing greater access, that helps us now and that helps us in the future. And, and we think if we start thinking about it longer term and, and, and taking everyone into account, we will get things done um, and publicly and privately. Thank you. I want to welcome Congressman Petri. I want to tell a story. Uh, I've been at Aspen for 11 years, and in one of my first years, I attempted to do a very important dialogue in New York City on child accounts. And I was new to the event business, and but I did know that I should send a car. If I were asking, I'd ask both Senator Corzine 
and uh, Congressman Petri to speak. Um, both had been interested in savings. They'd been long warriors for it. They were intrigued and interested in the child account idea. There was a bipartisan interest in this, which is exactly the space that Aspen. And so I tried to send a car to Penn Station in New York to get Congressman Petri from the train. And of course, the car and totally missed Congressman Petri, who jovially, in good Midwestern fashion, just strolled up uh, Fifth Avenue to our site and showed up my event just on time. And I will never forget that. I thank you. You have once again showed up at my event just on time. <laughs> this time, it was a snowstorm that's prevented everybody else. But uh, And you've arrived just when we were uh, looking for a moment of bipartisanship, and you modeled that in the fact that you've been here, but you've also stood with Aspen on many times. Congressman, uh, I welcome you to this group, which is heavily uh, experts, uh, heavily staffers, and people who are here today to hear more about working towards a secure retirement and what can be done to strengthen the nation's saving system. Congressman Crowley opened our discussion by also uh, reimagining child accounts again, uh, as he also endorsed what uh, Congressman Neal had been doing in the automatic IRA and the Savers Credit Bill. So you are welcome to talk about whatever you want to talk about, uh, but uh, I couldn't be happier to have you here, and I want to thank you and recognize you. Yeah, I don't know about you. I discovered a long time ago that... Uh, especially when you're around Manhattan, it's not all that big. And traffic <laughs> is a little less congested than it used to be, but you can often get somewhere faster just by walking than by running around doing all this. I mean, it's good exercise, too. So uh, that, that was a win-win for me. Well, I got uh, 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 Richard Markowitz in my office is here somewhere. He's the, our, our expert on this, has worked in this area for many years and on other financial uh, uh, issues. Uh, I guess as a kid I got interested in this somewhat, and I don't know if it's apocryphal or true, but uh, Albert Einstein was supposedly and asked in some interview what the most powerful force in the universe was, and he said compound interest. <laughs> <coughs> And uh, if, depending on which side of that force you're on, it works for you or it grinds you down over, over time. And uh, so I've, I've often, I don't know if you really said that or not, but I've often thought about that. And it does, uh, the, the uh, uh, small uh, uh, actions can result in very big uh, outcomes over time. And uh, so it's important, for, I think, for us to try to be aware of that and do what we can to kind of encourage or set the table or make it more likely that people make small right actions rather than small uh, disastrous actions over the, over the long run. And I'm not telling anyone uh, who's a student much about all this because we all know about student loans and how the interest and how all that that works, and uh, it's it, uh, debt is a great uh, uh, thing uh, as a tool to enable you to do things that might not otherwise be possible. But it's a very dangerous situ thing as, as well, uh, and can easily, uh, if people are not financially sophisticated uh, or thinking about it, if they're casual about it, there's a lot of college kids when they go off with a credit card for the first time, learn. We sat down and had a lecture at our house about a cash card, not a, not a credit card. And I think a lot of, a lot of young people are doing that partly uh, in self-defense self uh, to make sure that they're not, not getting, at the end, you know, doing something, uh, uh, being a sport on some occasion and then paying for it, for it later. But I thought I'd maybe be mildly useful. You probably have heard this from others. Just spent a couple minutes going to surveying the situation in this this area. Uh, we clearly do have a big national problem, uh, and uh, half of American households have no retirement assets, and uh, uh, 
uh, in an individual retirement count or a workplace defined contribution plan. 25% have assets but uh, uh, less than $50,000. And it's very clear that that, that uh, means that people are going to need uh, and we're going to have a problem when they retire in trying to have income uh, to support that retirement. Uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that 74% uh, of full-time workers have access to a workplace retirement plan, but only 37% uh, of part-time workers have similar access. And participation rates in these plans is higher among state and local government uh, workers uh, among those in private industry, 64% have access to uh, retirement uh, benefits. Uh, some 82% of workers in medium and large organizations have access to a retirement plan. In small firms, it's only about 49% of workers. So it, 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 bigger organizations have the staff and spend the time trying to figure out how to do that. And government organizations have been pr pretty, pretty good, uh, good at it. And I think the federal government has been very uh, progressive in tr trying to make sure they have a plan that uh, works well for its employees and is modern and, and funded uh, uh, for the long term. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, it turns out that availability does not mean in the private sector that work, all workers participate in, in the plans. 49% of private industry employees actually participated in a workplace retirement plan, uh, e even though the availability was much higher. One in four workers do not take advantage of an important workplace benefit uh, to take a, a, a take-up gap uh, with serious implications for retirement security. So. Uh, we, we uh, uh, know that many employer-based retirement savings plans do have incentives to encourage people to participate. Employers will match contributions based on the level of savings. Uh, they have automatic enrollment, uh, default investment options, and annual escalation rates where an employee's contribution is increased automatically each year by a set percentage generally one or two percent to try to get them to a point where they have a, a, a nest egg that's, that's worth worthwhile. Uh, a recent survey showed by the American Benefits Institute found that 92 percent of employers uh, with 401k plans provided matching contributions. At 92 percent. So, uh, and, and I actually been involved with some private organizations or uh, insurance, uh, I was on the board of an insurance, uh, uh, mutual, uh, mutual insurance c company for a while, and they spent a lot of time working with uh, new employees particularly to make it clear to them that the, the, they, it was worthwhile for them to max out on the retirement because of the employer contribution, even if they had to borrow money uh, from, uh, for, for other needs because that employer contribution wasn't available otherwise and it was worth an awful lot over over time and I think employers are aware of that it em and employees uh, it's a good tool for employers in terms of re retaining a steady workforce people and increasing their commitment to their employer by having a good retirement uh, plan for people who are intending to work there long time long term so uh, it's it's not just pure altruism on the part of the employer it's it's a good good employee uh, 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 policy uh, but uh, what we found is that one thing I've been I'm th trying to see if and I think they're working on this and companies and there have been a number of articles on it uh, and that is to try to change the default uh, setting for enrolling. Uh, this is one of the most important things that can happen. Surveys have shown that uh, people may not affirmatively uh, and I've found this with my daughter again. She gets a job having to sit her down and lecture. Have you signed up for your retirement uh, 401k? Well, no, I, you know, I'll maybe do it in a year or two. No, 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 just do it now. Uh, if it were done the other way around, if, if you had to on-sign, 
a lot of people who aren't paying too much attention to this. We have other problems. New employees have a lot of other challenges, finding an apartment often, or all the rest of it. It is, I think, a very important uh, reform uh, that we can do that will increase, uh, according to the studies, participation in these plans significantly. And 20 years later, people will really thank the employer for having put that default uh, uh, in favor of participation rather than you having to affirmatively ask to uh, 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 participate. The uh, 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 as you know, when I think you've been talking about, there are a number of savings proposals that have been around uh, for, uh, over the time. Richard Neal has introduced H.R. 2035, the Automatic IRA Act, to require employers uh, that uh, do not provide access to a retirement plan to establish for uh, each new employee an individual retirement account. And uh, uh, the Heritage Foundation uh, has advocated for automatic IRAs. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, 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 we need to do all that we can to make sure that that uh, these plans are as widely available as possible. One thing that I've worked on with some of my colleagues and with with your organization is this, and with the Senator Corzine, uh, is this concept of child savings accounts. Again, that's where the long period of time and compounding uh, it makes a big difference if you. If you would put put a thousand dollars or some amount of money in uh, an account uh, at birth, the rule of thumb used to be it varies obviously as interest rates and inflation rates and all the rest of it change. That leaving aside the tax taxes, uh, you could expect that money would double about every seven years, and. Uh, as a as a young child, I used to when I was learning math, you start with a dollar. How long will it take before you're a millionaire? Well, it, it that starts very slowly. But by the time you, if you start at age, you know, zero and double every seven years, you'd be surprised. By the time you're 65 or 70 or something, it gets to be a huge amount of money. So this this. Uh, uh, that's a little illusory because of inflation and depend, depending on all that, but it nonetheless is certainly a lot better than not not doing it. And uh, I, so I've thought child savings accounts uh, as, as a way of trying to uh, help people uh, see and learn by watching how the uh, interest compounds and benefits of it, uh, and uh, that it might encourage family members to, if they did exist, to maybe when they're, if they're giving a gift to a child to put five or ten dollars into that account on birthdays and Christmas and other, other celebratory occasions and just be a vehicle for uh, building that up. One of the difficulties with the child savings account concept is that, of course, once you establish it, if you do, Every good cause in the world would like to say, well, it should be available for education, or it should be available for buying work tools for the first job, or it should be available for buying a vehicle, or it should be buying for a down payment on your first, whatever it is, there are going to be 101 uh, things that are uh, uh, useful and desirable. But, but I've always th tried to resist that because I've thought the idea of having it there and compounding for a very long period of time and really being available when you needed it in retirement uh, was a, basically a, a good uh, social investment because somehow or another we're going to have to figure out how to take care of and are figuring out how to take care of people who have uh, no nest egg. And if they do have a nest egg, that will basically help the uh, uh, financial uh, picture for our, for our country. So anyway, that's a little overview of, of it. I've never sense that any of this is particularly uh, partisan. Uh, there some comments were made a little earlier about how people uh, maybe are not introducing it at once. In the past, what's happened is that uh, usually an organization like yours or some other groups will come with a concept and talk to members 
uh, and try to get uh, someone from each party in the House and Senate, and then we'll send letters around looking for co-sponsors and just to kind of get the idea uh, included in the mix and hopefully uh, help uh, both uh, the private sector as it reviews these things and maybe as we do other things, uh, encourage uh, people to, to uh, put a bias in favor of having retirement savings rather than against it. I've co-sponsored this Congress uh, legislation that does or would do what uh, for uh, private retirement accounts, what is already done by the federal government. If you have a, you know, you have one of these, uh, uh, whatever we call it, our, our retirement savings account, and, and they will send you a statement every year now, I think, saying how, what you're, what, how much you can expect to get a month uh, at age, whatever it is, 65 or something, uh, from with the amount that you have in that account. And uh, uh, that's a kind of a guideline. Should I be trying to put more in, f if I can, if I have that option faster, or, or is it adequate? Uh, I think it, it is a little sobering, but also encouraging. If you do that over years, see it start creeping up. Uh, uh, and uh, and realize that you not only will get your Social Security and your basic pension, but then you'll have an additional uh, amount and watch that uh, uh, grow. So we're trying to do that so that people can visualize and benchmark simply where they are. Because otherwise people see $50,000, they think, well, maybe that's adequate. And they realize if they get that account that that's not going to be uh, the kind of lifestyle that they want in their retirement. Or they're going to have to keep on working part-time or whatever if they want to uh, uh, you know, stay in their home and all the rest. Anyway, thank you for your interest in this. I've been delighted working with, the, uh, with your institute on these issues. I think they're, they're not necessarily high uh, emotional, but they're very, very important. And uh, I, I look forward to working with you on, on these issues in the future. So thank you very much. I can try, yeah. He said uh, Congressman P. Triwell is willing to try a few questions. So do we have any? If I don't know the answer, Richard Markowitz will know the answer. Yes. Yeah, that would that's they have you know as you know, my impression is I, I mean I actually the way the federal we've had hearings uh, before the Education Workforce Committee on the federal retirement program. Some of the private uh, uh, there were some issues about uh, uh, some of the mechanics of it. Some people and they have a small committee of very responsible people. I think that basically has a has a bidding every four or five years and contract with someone to manage the whole thing. And the last time I heard it was Barclays Bank out of London that manages the federal, our U.S. federal government retirement accounts. But that's, uh, that's not discouraging. It's, I mean, they do it for Ohio. They do it for other countries. It's a huge amounts, And they do, it's a computer thing, and they balance it and all that. So it's very well done. And the overhead costs of the federal retirement pension program in terms of fees and all the rest are minuscule. So it, but anyone who's thinking of having a uh, individual IRA as a fe or some other 401, you know, other savings program, first top up on your federal because the fees get you over time and there is no, no program that's more efficient than the federal retirement program, I don't think, in the whole, uh, maybe, maybe some of these index accounts come come closer in, in the ballpark, but it's very well done. Uh, they, I, my impression is that they do try to survey and work on that, and the reason for the uh, U.S. government bond d default is that for new people, especially who are unfamiliar with all of this, it seems the safest and most conservative 
thing that it can do, and that's what people, uh, most people seem to want. Now the returns are not over time as good, uh, and uh, either of us, I, I, I won't say, I have one, I say what I do, but I, I'm, I'm sort of an outlier, because I have, it, but, but uh, uh, I, I'm, I mean, I was, as a young person, I would frankly uh, probably not try to, you can switch, you just can call up or go to your account and you can switch and move the percentages back and forth and so on and so forth very uh, easily and at no cost and you do it every, so I'm, uh, I mean, if I were doing it, I would probably either put it all in, in, uh, you, one of the U.S. stock accounts or small cap accounts, or uh, the private bond tends to do a little better than the government bond, if I recall. Uh, or if you really want to be, you can do a little international, a little uh, uh, domestic, and a little government bond uh, and mix it. They do have an option, you know, to give, if you give you advice when you're nearing retirement and you can glide into a very conservative investment profile they, that's a service that they provide uh, but uh, the key thing is if you're not going to have to uh, use the money for some years it's really you're really smart taking the Warren Buffett approach which is to try to not play not move in and out not understand you're going to have some years where you're going to lose and some years where you're going to win but over look at what, what the, the average is and it'll work out. You'll have you'll get some really good years. You, you know, if you're really lucky, moving around. But the odds are you might move just the wrong way, and you'll 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 shoot yourself in the foot uh, and lose a couple of years uh, income. We just had one. You know, last year the stock market was up thirty percent. So uh, everyone who is in that is feeling very very good because they were glum when the things were down and they were, everyone was underwater by 30, 40%. Now that's all been made back and they've achieved a rate of return that's equal to or a little better than the government bond uh, account is my, my impression. Uh, but uh, if I guess if I were doing it, I'd start out at least for young people uh, at a kind of a, a moderate to conservative mix rather than just the government bond account, and but make it clear they could study up on it, and they, could, they give you charts every, every quarter showing the return on these different assets uh, over a period of years, and so it's, it's, they try to make it as simple as possible, and it, different people have different attitudes. Some people just don't want, you know, they do these studies on human nature, and people are, are willing to forego considerable gains to avoid uh, experiencing losses. They don't like to experience losses, uh, even though uh, you, you could come out considerably ahead if you are willing to recognize some losses in, in exchange for greater gains over a period of, period of years. It's just the way we're all, we're made up differently, so. You've got one more question? Well, this, this is the thing. Uh, the, there are four million people roughly born in the United States each year, so if you're doing an individual children's account, you're talking about $4 billion uh, that you're putting into that uh, account. Now, in some sense, it's at least uh, initially an accounting thing because if it's invested back in government bonds or in some uh, uh, mix, it's not costing the government immediately anything. Uh, but uh, people worry about the budget things. I got interested in it because I, I, I took seriously all the worry about Social Security and, how, and I figured, well, it was pay as you go and if you wanted to switch over to a, an endowment approach, someone's going to have to pay twice, right? You, uh, uh, and, and just the nature of it. And 
the simplest thing if you want to do it was to start very young and spread that payment over as long as possible so that uh, you could switch from the pay as you go to an endowment. But it turns out no one's really interested in switching to an endowment approach. It's, it's really a government transfer program that's the way that people at Treasury look at it, not the way our constituents think of it as an individual account uh, and separate. And the, you, it's, you get a lot of kabuki in all this, this budgeting stuff. But I still think it's a good idea to encourage savings to get, but uh, so the answer is, if there's a surplus, you know the deficit's coming down pretty fast right now, and uh, we maybe it's hard to believe, but we may conceivably run into some situations where we'll have surpluses in a few years, though people uh, say it's unlikely to last for a long time. But if we did, one of my preferences would be to not just use it for a temporary tax cut, but to squirrel it away in, in effect in, for, for national savings in this way that where it was behind every individual. Uh, and I, I think once that caught on, the p politics of it would be every kid gets a thousand dollars. Well, what about his older brother? What about me? You know, so the tendency would be to start spreading it to give, it, give everyone these accounts. And the nice thing about it is it, uh, uh, the older you are, the less uh, uh, the government's going to get the money. You're gonna, they're going to get it and, and, and uh, spend it uh, uh, in, in fewer years. And it's, and it, it's not going to cost as much uh, as it would look on, on the surface. So. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So you'll see, you will now see why I deeply appreciate Congressman Petri and those remarks. Thank you, Richard. Um, we're going to close out our event eventually with Mark Avery, uh, who is uh, going to say a little more about the MyRA. Uh, this is an acronym event and a, an event that is densely heavy with account names. We have U.S. accounts, the Crowley proposal, my RA, the Obama proposal, and we've heard about the automatic IRA, the Neil proposal. Um, uh, while we are waiting for Mark, I want to come back to our panel and to you all. If you have questions for our panel, I want to invite you to say those now, and otherwise you get my questions again. So anybody have questions for Jeremy, Judy, or Eric? Uh, Sean, I saw you first, and then I'm going to come to you. Judy, Eric, or Jeremy, do you want any comments? And just again, if you didn't hear Sean O'Brien's question, it's about auto enrollment. It was made uh, extended in the Pension Protection Act of 2006, yet the effectiveness of this is still in question. When will we see it? I haven't seen the 
Oops, thank you. <laughs> I haven't seen that uh, Aon Hewitt study. I, for some reason, thought it was more like 30 percent, but whatever it is, um, I think they, there's a there's a couple of of pieces to it. One is that my understanding is that most employers, when they put it in, only uh, auto enroll new people. So it's not that it, it takes a number of years after it's instituted to actually have an automatically enrolled workforce. Um, and and there are some employers that that tried it and and stepped back from it. Um, particularly, uh, I don't want to name names, but some that are uh, in more of a high turnover kind of environment. But I, you know, in terms of when will we'll see the results of it. Um, I mean, if it's 60%, then, then that's good. And I would think that, you know, certainly in, you know, 10 years would, would see some serious results, but if it's only 30% <laughs> and, um, you know, then, it, then it's going to be a lot slower going, obviously. Um, so I, I do think the evidence is that when people are automatically enrolled, they, they do largely stay in. So, uh, to me, it's just a matter of, I, I don't know what the exact date is right now, but it is going to be a matter of time, and the fact that, that it's only new hires, I think, has a, has a major impact Drag on that. On the thing. Uh, Eric? I would just add that I, I haven't seen this, this study either, but mm -hmm. um, one of the most powerful forces in retirement savings um, uh, is inertia. So we do know that when people enroll in these, they do tend to stay in them. Um, our con our uh, concern is that you need auto enrollment you also need auto escalation because if you auto enroll someone at the, the amounts that they do then the amounts tend to be very very small and it does take a long time to make a big difference but if you can add that with auto escalation and a lot of employers and public and private have been very reluctant to do that to make those demands or commitments on their employees thank you now i can recognize you Right. I think you all heard the question that defined benefit expansions. And to the credit, there's a wonderful other conference going on right now uh, with NERS on that question. So we're probably thinly staffed in this room. But uh, <laughs> Judy and Jeremy and Eric, a reaction? I, I, I seriously doubt it. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm an actuary. I would love for them to, to make a resurgence. But... Um, and, and cash balance plans are actually popular um, as new plans in the smaller business environment. But um, I, I think for, for whatever reason, um, I, I just can't see how we're going to make them so attractive that a, a large corporation is going to want to come back and, and put in a new DB plan. I don't see that happening. Maybe I'm wrong, but I just don't see that happening. Eric, since you manage some of these. I mean, there's not much to add. I, mean, I, I do think um, where they're still in place, they are, as you referenced, they are an important part of having people, ha helping people have a real chance at having a good retirement. But it is hard to see. I, the trend is the other way, right, obviously. And um, I, I have a hard time seeing what those forces would be that would turn that trend around. I would cite to the Congressman Crowley's earlier number, if 40 million people still rely on the DB system we must not do anything that doesn't strengthen their hold. So I thought that was an interesting quote from Congressman Crowley. And I know often the let's not weaken what we have is the watchword of many of us in the retirement system. Other questions? So if I am going to get one more question while we wait for Mark, and hopefully someone on my staff will tell me if there's any change. If we get one more snow delay today, I will. Uh, um, and this is in anticipation of Mark Avery coming. I, too, was sitting on the couch with the popcorn, uh, surprised at the president's announcement of my RA, and, uh, uh, and yet cheered that retirement security would be back in the news and back in the State of the Union again. And I've also been surprised by the attention that this very modest 
tool has received, which is essentially starting folks voluntarily in a um, in a completely a G fund, in a retirement bond, all bond fund, very similar to what uh, public employees have in the Federal Thrift Savings Program. And I, I wanted just some reactions uh, from my panel, even before we get Mark here, as we think about um, the president's uh, use of this tool, um, whether you're willing to give, any of you give some thoughts going forward about uh, since this is going to happen, because uh, it's a pen and a phone kind of action, it doesn't need this body to approve it. Um, what are you willing to think, Judy, Jeremy, or Eric, where this will leave us, starting in this way with offering some pieces of the millions who are outside of this system, offering some of them a way to get started? Will where that leave us? Wonder if reaction. <coughs> Jeremy? Yeah, what what I would what I was really excited about is when we talk about this, we often talk, you know, people talk about the plumbing, and we always we typically talk about the water. We're talking about water pressure in this case, like how much money is going into the system. But for a lot of people, they don't have the pipes to connect to the system. And what's so exciting about my RA is that it creates that connection for people that currently don't have it. And looking forward, what I think is is so exciting about it is, I think it would meld well and connect well to a lot of the things we've already talked about today. So like how does a Myra at some point in time, if it grows to a certain size, can be rolled into an IRA that could be connected to an auto automatically enrolled IRA with an employer? How could the savers credit incentivize low income savers to put money into that and get a match? So what's so exciting is that it creates the plumbing for people to connect to the system. And we so have Mark just, uh, just walked in. Eric or Judy, a quick comment before we hear from Mark. Well, for, uh, for, for us, we were just excited to hear um, the president talking about expanding savings at any level. That's just, I mean, that just having that conversation, that discussion just points to the fact of, of what an issue it is. So we're thrilled uh, with that. And any, anytime we can establish the habit of people saving earlier, it's just a good thing. Great. As far as we're concerned, it's all about auto IRA. And uh, if you look at the Neal bill, there is a, the default is uh, Treasury is directed to create something like this, and now Treasury is creating this. So we feel like the the structure will be in place, and uh, let's go. Mark, we are warming up the crowd for you. Uh, we are very pleased that you are here. Uh, we have had a wonderful morning. Started with Congressman Crowley, and we ended with uh, Congressman Petri. And Mark, we are thrilled that you were here. We started the MyRA. You can remind us what it is, uh, but we started your. Uh, we just started this discussion. I'm very thankful that you showed up. So, welcome. Hi. Hey, Judy. Lisa, thanks. It's great to be here. Um, it's a terrific group, and uh, I uh, agreed vehemently with everything I heard in the last two minutes since I got here, and have uh, very little to add. Uh, but it it is uh, definitely the case, you know, as I think as Eric, you were saying, that it's heartening to have uh, more focus on this issue, right, on the need to get more people prepared for retirement, the gap in our retirement security and our retirement savings situation, including, you know, as the uh, president repeatedly notes, first and foremost, the importance of supporting Social Security uh, and making sure that that remains, you know, the bulwark and bedrock uh, that it is. Uh, and second, uh, supporting our employer plan system, which uh, is still a uh, important fundamental second pillar in the United States that's doing so much to deliver benefits uh, to the middle income folks and many lower income folks in this country uh, that has both in the defined benefit and in the defined contribution format significant cross subsidies built in so that the more eager savers, those of us in the higher tax brackets, can bring along 
the more reluctant savers, those in the lower tax brackets, uh, and so that we can uh, maximize our ability to get people into the habit of saving uh, and develop the culture of saving. Those defined benefit and defined contribution plans have gone a long way and are still growing, and we're still doing everything we can to support, promote them, and make them more effective, including the 401k automatic features, such as automatic enrollment, escalation of contributions, auto-enrolling people who are not just new hires, but have been in the job for a while and haven't been participating in the plan, uh, and other plan design aspects, including more employer contributions, more matching contributions, even non-matching employer contributions, uh, to make the plan, the 401k and its uh, variants, the 403b, the 457, to make those more effective uh, saving vehicles. And to do what we can to keep promoting, uh, supporting the defined benefit plans, uh, where they're the most robust in the aggregate in our state and local system, and where they're uh, still an important part uh, of the system in the corporate world, uh, despite the, the trend uh, to, um, to freeze in many cases and to uh, uh, adopt new plans that are of a, of a DC nature. Uh, the MyRA is uh, an attempt to uh, do what Judy was just alluding to, really, to take a first step toward uh, something more sweeping and ambitious, uh, namely automatic enrollment of the tens of millions of American workers uh, that don't have access to an employer plan today and therefore can't be automatically enrolled. Uh, if we can get them automatically enrolled into payroll deduction IRAs uh, at the workplace in the case of employers that are not sponsoring that, sp that are not sponsoring a plan, uh, if we can't persuade that employer to sponsor a plan, then at least let's persuade that employer or call upon that employer to let people use its payroll system to save and that set it and forget it automatic way uh, that, um, that the rest of us, most of us have access to. And so the MyRA absent so far, the kind of uh, legislative result that we're hoping for and looking for uh, by enacting automatic IRAs. Uh, the, the MyRA is an administrative step designed to go down that road uh, to the extent we can now uh, before legislation is enacted and uh, at least use the payroll deduction method of saving uh, and the uh, appeal of an investment option that for some segment of our population would be more uh, comforting or more enticing than uh, those that involve market risk. So not as a suggestion that people invest in, in uh, principal protected uh, investments as their whole uh, portfolio, uh, that they do so uh, in the long term but as a starter, uh, as a way to get some of the hesitant folks who haven't been saving at all to feel more comfortable that the risk of loss uh, in a down market uh, isn't something that, if it worries them, they need to deal with uh, if they want to save, that there's a way to at least start without that. We set a $15,000 cap on the amount of the bond, this is essentially a U.S. savings bond backed by the full faith and credit of the United States and uh, has no risk of diminishing in value at any time. Whatever interest is added to it stays and gets further supplemented by, by more interest. Uh, this is a, an investment that simplifies the process and is intended to target not most of us, but just the people who aren't saving now, who are predominantly lower and moderate income, who aren't not eligible for an employer plan, 
you know, not eligible to participate in a DB or a 401k, uh, and who are particularly hesitant about the kind of investment options that most of us and most of the 401k uh, universe is in, ones that do have some market risk in the interest of potential higher growth over the long term. So if we can get people started by uh, inducing them to begin with a savings bond and then roll over into the private sector and invest in uh, whatever way they choose, uh, that would be uh, moving the ball forward. And that's what this is intended to do. It's not intended to be a big solution to the whole retirement gap, obviously not. Uh, but it is intended to be a step we can take now that's meaningful and that not only will hopefully get a lot of new savers saving for the first time, getting into that habit, and once they're in the habit, hopefully making it a lifelong habit and continuing it in the private sector. Uh, the other benefit from this would uh, hopefully be that it will make clear to employers, to stakeholders generally, and to Congress that maintaining a payroll deduction for saving is something easy for an employer to do. It's something that does not inflict uh, costs or hassles on an employer that, uh, that need deter it uh, from, from offering that easy way to save. So that's the, uh, the step that we hope will help lead to enactment of a more robust solution that will ultimately cover not just millions but tens of millions of additional people who have no uh, saving going on today. Lisa, discussion, Q&A. Uh, first of all, I uh, want to thank you folks and Mark uh, Morial, who uh, you know, Lisa and I have uh, spent time with him uh, on these issues, and we very much salute his commitment uh, and your organization's commitment to bettering the middle class and particular uh, retirement saving and retirement security. Uh, the employer's incentive here is that people like it when the employer helps them save. You know, it's that simple. We know that employee benefits generally, whether it's a health plan, a 401k, or even a substitute uh, for an actual plan that is intended at least to tide people over until we can get the employer to take that next step and adopt an actual plan whether it's a defined benefit or a defined contribution plan. But this would be something that employees would appreciate. The employers know that to recruit the people they want, to retain the skilled people they want to retain, it helps to provide a, an attractive and meaningful benefits package. Um, you know, Sean, you and I were just talking about this uh, last night, that employers that provide more robust benefits uh, get um, much more employee appreciation and uh, have an edge in terms of recruiting uh, in, the, in the labor market for the people they really want. And increasingly, as we get attention to this issue, more Americans are going to be sensitive to the fact that this is important, that they, for their own families, for, their own, for, for themselves and for the country as a whole, um, uh, need to be saving more, and employer-based plans are the best way to, to do that. So uh, lots of employers have plans now. 
This is to encourage those employers that are willing to to offer this to their employees who are not eligible for those plans. So if it's an employer without a plan, this doesn't require any compliance with tax qualification and rules and ERISA rules that a regular plan involves. But we don't think this is going to persuade any employer not to have a plan. This isn't a replacement or a substitute for a plan. It's a teaser. We want this to be something that the employer recognizes is essentially costless for it to sponsor, will arouse appreciation among its workforce because it's helping them save, and will um, hopefully lead a lot of these employers to decide, you know, payroll deduction saving on a tax-favored basis, this is pretty good. Our people like it. Why haven't I adopted at least a 401k until now? Maybe it's the matching contribution. Maybe they're not ready to step up and make a contribution. But once they see tangibly how employees appreciate the opportunity to save on a convenient basis at the workplace, we're hoping more employers will say, yeah, I can make a bit of a match. I can make a bit of a contribution uh, and uh, we'll adopt a, an actual plan. So that's our hope that this will lead to that just as automatic IRAs, uh, if we can get that enacted, will lead to much more uh, formation of 401ks and other employer plans as employers who haven't had a plan see how it's really pretty easy and it's really worth it. Yes. Uh, that's, uh, that's just the way we've been thinking about it, that there are a lot of people who aren't saving now who want to know exactly what am I getting. Uh, they want to take some of the risk out of it or some of the uncertainty out of it. So we're telling them, here's exactly what you're getting. You're getting an investment that is backed by the full faith and credit of the United States, like any other savings bond or treasury security. It's secure, and it has no risk of loss. They're getting an interest rate that is variable, but is the same rate that federal employees get, many of us in this room, if they choose the government securities fund in the federal thrift savings plan, federal 401k type plan. And that variable rate, though it, it is variable each time it's set and it's reset monthly, it isn't going to be negative. It's always going to be adding to your account. There's no risk of loss in this bond. And uh, the bond will be in a Roth IRA so that it can be transferred, as you were suggesting, transferred into the private sector tax-free when the person is ready to do that. They'll have plenty of time. If they want to save very slowly, they'll be able to, to save an initial amount as little as $25 to open the account. And they'll be able to save as little as $5 each time they want to contribute. So someone could be adding to this very, very gradually uh, and take years before they're ready to go into the private sector, and that would be fine. Uh, there's a 30-year limit. If at, after 30 years they haven't reached $15,000 in their accumulation in this bond, then they would go over to the private sector, uh, as people would who have 15,000 uh, who reach it more quickly, as most people probably would. Last question. The marketing plan um, began uh, recently when we had the uh, President of the United States pitch this. 
in the State of the Union address. I say we had. You know, he's been very enthusiastic about this. He wanted to present it, um, and so we had the good fortune, you know, as you were all discussing earlier, of getting more high-level attention to our issue. Um, so we've gotten tons of attention now, lots of press coverage, lots of people asking about it. Uh, so that's the first phase in the marketing. The second phase is that Treasury is talking to employers. It's getting a lot of requests from employers for more information uh, and is going to have a, an initial phase here that is uh, limited so not every employer, for starters, that might want to do this would necessarily participate. We're going to invite employers to do so, but we're going to look for a little bit of diversification in terms of geography and size, maybe industry, so that we can walk before we run. You know, kind of try it out, see how it works in different settings, workplace settings, and learn from that, and then make it available to everyone, to all employers that are interested and all employees um, who are interested. And to, to your earlier question, uh, we're hoping that once this gets off the ground and it's all working smoothly based on payroll deduction, that it'll be expanded so that individuals who don't have an employer or don't have a workplace payroll deduction opportunity can just contribute directly on their own uh, to, to purchase these bonds, um, self-employed and, and so forth. And also so that people who get tax refunds, which is still most American taxpayers, will be able to have IRS directly deposit part of their refund uh, into uh, one of these uh, MyRA bonds. Lisa, thank you very much. It's great to be here. And thanks for all that you do. Mark with us, and especially today when we have a chance to talk about this new policy. We are at 2 o'clock, snow be damned, as uh, Congressman Crowley started us out. I want to thank you all very much for coming. We did it. I thank you for your attendance, and I look forward to seeing you at a future event. Thank you.